One of those keys to healthy living is eat well. But how do we eat well? Lots of questions on the open line last night and text messages as well. Well, tonight we're going to be speaking with a leading dietitian. Her name is Sarah DiLorenzo. She's the author of the 1010 Simple Recipe book. And I wanted to get Sarah on to bust some food myths. Is milk good for you? Is a lot of red meat bad for you? Lots of food myths that I don't have the answers to, but Sarah does, and she's with us this morning. Good morning, Sarah. Hi, how are you? Thank you for having me. No worries. Thanks for coming on. It can be hard, can't it, for for just, you know, single people or heads of households or whatever trying to make informed, healthy decisions when often we have no idea if it's healthy or not. I think it is one of the hardest things and I get asked those, I was listening to you and I get asked these questions so many times because there is so many food myths out there. We hear different things in advertising or different studies or old old information or information from people who aren't updated with the latest research and yeah, it's a minefield and um, I love answering and busting these myths because um, you know, I look at all the evidence and that's kind of where where it lies. So let's start. What are we going to start Let's with. get into it. Okay, well, Let's I'm going to start. It. Let's start at the beginning of the day, although here on Overnight's, our beginning of the day is midnight. But for yes. <laughs> for people with normal sleep habits, let's let's start with breakfast. Is it the most important meal of the day? Look, I truly do believe it is. And I'm going to, like, when our body, when we wake up, our body is, um, like, with the circadian rhythms, our body really responds to our, our digestion and metabolism. So they really do start in the morning and our body's really open to kind of receiving glucose. And so I truly believe it is. So the research shows that people who have breakfast and start their day with a healthy breakfast, I'm talking about eggs or oats or something like that, um, they have better concentration, they have better mood, they have better energy levels, and they tend to take in around 400 calories less than those that don't. Um, and they're generally healthier people. I know it's a term that was coined by Kellogg's to, you know, bre- you know, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. That was, you know, for cornflakes, and that's a kind of marketing thing. But no, I truly believe looking at the evidence, and it does. And if you look at the people that live around the world to 110 in the blue zones, they all start their day with a huge breakfast. So mm. they they have the dinner as a pauper, and that's, that's where the evidence lies. So yes, breakfast is, in my opinion, the most important meal of the day. And what about fasting, be it long-term or let's just start with skipping meals. So if you have a big brekkie, you skip lunch. Is that yeah. is that good for you? I always believe, look, I've always believed in keeping the body topped up throughout the day. Like, I don't believe in having big, huge meals at all or overeating. I kind of like the concept behind behind eating till you're 80% full so you don't get into that kind of overeating. Um, as far as fasting goes, look, again, I've looked at all the studies at the research. I've looked at the time-restricted feeding, the 16-8. All the success I've seen people have with fasting is when they've done low calorie fasting. So they've sat at, you know, around 500 calories a day. And that can be, you know, that that's individual. It can be throughout the course of the day having, you know, it's like an egg for breakfast or a garden salad for lunch and a tiny soup at night. They're great. I'm a very big believer in low calorie fasting, but not time restriction because what it can lead to is overeating when it comes time for the next meal. People are starving or they're waiting for that time frame to open up and they just tend to over. And in my in my experience, they just end up eating double the amount of calories that they would ordinarily. So, yeah, I, yeah. that's definitely a thing. Now, maybe I was, uh, well, I was a younger man and maybe my metabolism um, was better back then. But when I was in my mid-20s, I did the 5-2 diet. Um, so that's five days of normal yeah. eating, two days of under 500 calories. And I'll, I'll say that it was very hard. I was so hungry on the two days. Um Unbelievably so, but I got to tell you, I indulged on the five days. I overate for sure, and, yeah. and the actually the weight fell off me. Now I don't know if I was healthy, but I lost a lot of weight. But I suppose it's it's kind of not one size fits all because I must say the two days were almost unachievable. I was so yeah, hungry. harrowing for some people. They are they are really hard to do. And I mean, look, I know the five two diet's been around for a long time, and then. It had, as so many people had huge success, but it was, you know, what was your quality of life like on those two days? Yeah, Is terrible. it one of my, yeah, and you, what, what, you know, were you good company? I mean, there's a lot of things to think about how food can impact your mental health or your mood. And 
Um, I do believe in these low-calorie days. I have a lot of strategies around them when I talk about them clinically, where as far as go to bed early, drink um, herbal teas throughout the day, keep your water intake up, maybe delay breakfast um, till like 10 a.m. instead of skipping it till 12, um, or do it on a day that you're extremely busy. It's for some, And like I think with these kind of things, it's one, it's, there's just no one size fits all. It's yeah. very individual. I know people who absolutely love them. I personally do a 600 calorie day, probably once or twice a week. And I do it when I'm super, super, super busy and I come home and I go to bed quite early. Yeah. But they, I, I enjoy them. Whereas some people, um, I mean, look, they're hugely successful, the low calorie ones, as opposed to time restriction. But again, it just comes down to, it, it, it comes, it's very individual. As yeah. I said, it's just, yeah, it's interesting the fasting because it is very popular. Yeah. Okay. You mentioned um, water. How much water should, you know, your average man or woman drink a day? Okay, this is, this is very individual. So the best way to know how we're adequately hydrated is 30 mils per kilo of your own body weight. It's not that 1945 nutrition advice where you have eight glasses of water a day. I mean, that's still, that's, you know, that's, that's advice that was created in 1945. So it's 30 mils per kilo of your body weight has just been shown mm-hmm. through research to give each individual their adequate amount of hydration. So if you're 60 kilos, 1.8 litres a day. And it's good because you can also drink, as well as being dehydrated, on the flip side, there's people who can drink too much water and flush out their electrolytes. So it's just finding that happy medium. And I think that's great. I mean, I love that because everyone can actually really understand you know, I'm, I, I weigh, you know, what, 70 kilos, I need 2.1 litres a day. And that's all you need. You know, thinking, because so many of us think, I need to drink my water. I've got to get my water up. And you yeah. see people walking around with, and over drinking water and, and everything, like, it's finding that happy medium. I definitely yeah. over drink. Do you? I well, I drink a lot of water. water. I mean, I'm always, I'm always sipping on a water bottle. And you know what? It's because I have a water bottle. I've never drunk yes. so much since I got a water bottle, and now it goes with me everywhere, and I'm always sipping on it. Um, yeah, so how much water do you think you're having a day? We I reckon I might have. know what your weight is. Well, <laughs> you know what? We might know your weight. I weigh 87 kilos, and so I'm okay. meant to have 2.6 or 7 or whatever it is, and yeah. I reckon yeah. I'm having three and a half litres a day. Yeah, I've got a little tip for you. This is a little bit of I, – if, if you came and if you were in front of me in my clinic, I would say, why don't you drop a little bit of hydrolyte in there as well? Sometimes I'm a very big believer in just putting it in that – getting that hydration up, just making sure your electrolytes are in balance. So um, I personally do those um, electrolytes a couple of times a week. I love those. Yeah. But we're going off track here now. We've got to get back to busting myths. Okay, so um, um, yeah. yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah, but it's definitely yeah. over drink. And that th- 30 mil per kilo, that's a good one for that's, everyone yeah. Everyone to write down. Okay, now a couple of foods, potatoes, yeah. good oh, or bad? are amazing now i feel sorry for potatoes so it depends so okay so potatoes are bad if you're having them in the form of chips and deep frying them because you've got that fried element they are i mean look there's you've got your white potatoes and sweet potatoes they're a great source of fiber they're an excellent source of in particular the sweet potato with that beautiful beta carotene that converts to vitamin a that's great for vision it's also got vitamin c and white potatoes have vitamin c in them potassium they are a staple in my household. My children, we've, I mean, that's our staple carbohydrate here. Um, potatoes, absolutely 100%. But it comes down to how are you making your potatoes? Mm. Uh, a lot of people, like, you know, they don't like potatoes because they feel like they're a carb. Carbs are a really important part of a healthy, balanced diet. They're one of our three macronutrients, the other being protein and fats. We need, no, absolutely 100%. I'm a big fan of potatoes. Um, I love them, and again, I always say to people who are who are sort of living a, uh, a lifestyle where um, they're having like a, a just moderate kind of energy expenditure. Uh, always have your carbohydrates, and this is just a little tip at breakfast or lunch, not at dinner. Um, just to make sure you're getting enough of that good balance of your macronutrients. I've gone off a little bit on a tangent mm, there, but that's interesting. I just don't want people to be scared of carbs and think, oh, potatoes are bad. Yeah, if you make them into deep fried chips, of course they are. I mean, that they're you know they're going to elevate disease, inflammation, etc. But no, outside of that, I'm a huge fan, and they are delicious. Yeah. Oh, good sweet potato, baked, yum, yeah. sweet, delicious, caramelised, yum. I'm a big potato person. What about eggs? Yeah. Oh, eggs. Poor, the poor egg has just had such a battering yeah. with eggs, raised cholesterol. Absolutely not. They are a superfood. Eggs 
are a great food. They are a little powerhouse of nutrient density. You've got all the B vitamins in there. Yes, they naturally contain cholesterol, but if your diet's healthy, your body will regulate your cholesterol anyway. So um, they're a great source of protein. I mean, I the, the studies that were done, and I think it was around 30 years ago where eggs were you know, ever giving people heart disease, I would really love to see the in-depth behind the scenes of that study because I think that it was what these study participants were having their eggs with, such as hash browns or bacon. What was within the study? Because eggs themselves, there is absolutely no evidence to say they cause heart disease or elevate cholesterol. In fact, quite the opposite. They lower the LDL cholesterol in some studies. So eggs... Cheap, affordable, cost of living right now. You know, making things like frittatas at night. I mean, you're doing cheap dinners and you've got your veg in there and cost effective. Um, no eggs. Big, big, um, yes, big eggs tick. from me. Yeah, right, big tick. Big with tick. potatoes as well. You're listening to Overnights with Ned Green. Sarah DiLorenzo is on the line with us, the author of the 1010 Simple Recipe Book, as Sarah's a clinical nutritionist and she's busting a few food myths for us. Now, a couple, uh, couple more fruit yeah. juices. Are, are, yeah, fruit, I'm, are fruit juices bad? Yeah, I'm not a fan of fruit juices. I've never been a fan of just extracting the juice. Like fruit's meant to be enjoyed with the fibre attached to it. So when you have a fruit juice, you're just taking pretty much all of the fructose out of it. And you're, not, you're not coupling it with the fibre. So they can be really high in uh, calories. So, for example, just if you, if you were to juice a glass, I think maybe 375 mils of orange juice with oranges, you've got still in natural sugars, not added sugars. You're still looking around nine teaspoons of sugar. So I believe, um, I'm not, I wouldn't drink juice personally. I do truly believe that fruit is meant to be enjoyed in its true form where it has the fibre so that the fructose and the fibre give you a good slow release of energy and will not elevate blood glucose levels. Mm. So that's kind of what I see with um, with fruit juices. So that's my own personal opinion. I know people love them. They're very pro them. Um, but no, I, I, um, I can't give a fruit juice a tick from me. Yeah, right. <laughs> so if you've got, if you've got say, an orange in front of you, eat the orange, don't Absolutely. juice the orange. Absolutely, yeah, because then you, it, won't, it won't elevate your blood glucose and then dip it and then you're getting all the gorgeous fibre. I do believe in smoothies as opposed to that where you're blitzing the entire piece of right. fruit because it, I'm very big, I'm very pro smoothie but not juicing and separating the juice from it. So That's interesting. Yeah. So if yeah. you've got... If you've got a breakfast smoothie and you put in, you know, some berries and a banana and whatever, and yeah. and you're eating the totality of the produce, it's just blitzed. Yep. Big tick. Perfect. That's fine. Massive tick. And you know what? That is one of the best ways to start your day. And you, I do those smoothies at home, banana, blueberries. I throw cinnamon in there. I throw nut butter in there, a bit of almond milk, ice, some protein powder. I will blitz it and I can go and do something else while that's blitzing. And then I'm walking out the door with like a complete meal that's got a, a good balance of, of ingredients in there. That is incredibly delicious. And I mean, blueberries, I mean, I have half a cup of blueberries a day and I'm going off to, because of their, they're just antioxidant. Fabulous powerhouse, you know. So, yeah, absolutely. Little cute meal in one. Smoothies are great, and especially for fussy kids too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great stuff. Okay, two more to go. The last two. Full cream milk, bad or good? It's fine completely. I've always, I only do full cream milk here. Absolutely, 100%. It's completely fine because the fat, when you separate it, look, milk's very individual. A lot of people will drink milk based on taste. Um, I do, at my own home, I do sort of change around almond milk for baking. I'll use full cream milk for my kids. But yeah, it's got the fat in there. It will keep you full. It hasn't been separated. So it's, when you separate, take the fat out of the milk, it's basically lactose. So it's a carbohydrate. And when you have the foot, the fat in there with the carb, it keeps you full. And it tastes delicious. Yep, full cream milk all the way. Yeah. I would only have that. And, and as I said, in my home, we have a little bit of almond milk for baking. And, um, and, and sometimes I actually use a bit of soy milk too for coffee. So I change around milks. But no, I don't do anything light, sugar-free diet, any of those milks that have had the, the um, fat removed from it because simply you will get satiated as well. You know, you feel full when yeah. you have the good fats in there. 100%, yeah. Okay. It's all about whole food, real food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, on that, the last one, obviously, uh, protein being an important macronutrient, red meat, you know, it gets demonised, you know, and being vegetarian, vegan, you know, is very hip these days. Is red meat good or bad? Look, it depends. Like, this just comes down to, I mean, look, I'm, a, I'm the mother of three daughters who are all over, who are, you know, 14, 18 and 20. So for me, for their diet, I would probably factor it in once or twice a week um, just because they're young. 
they're still growing their young girls and, and they, young girls definitely need iron. Um, for me personally, I would probably have it once or twice a month. I don't think red meat's great every day. Um, I don't think it's a bad thing, but you've just got to watch your cuts of meat because the research still does, it's just the saturated fats that you get and the, and the cuts of meat. But if you look at the success of diets around the world, and this is just going back into evidence, people who long, live long, healthy lives, the Mediterranean diet, for example, they only have red meat probably once a month. So it's, in my opinion, to answer that question, red meat, just do the red meat maybe once a week or maybe once a fortnight, but I don't think red meat should definitely be an everyday protein choice for a family. So where would you it's get awesome. your protein from? Well, so chicken, for, for our house, we, we mix around, so fish, tofu, chicken, uh, turkey, sometimes pork, it depends. Um, but, yeah, just change, just changing it up. I mean, we... Uh, we would, my children personally love, they, they they love chicken. It's an easy meat to cook, but we would, um, it depends, you know, it also can depend on budget. Red meat is incredibly expensive right now. I don't know yeah. if you've had a look lately, but it is. But um, in moderation, yes, and look for a leaner cut, just not, not so much saturated fat on it. Um, there's great lean cuts, or maybe once a week, a roast or something, but I just wouldn't say, I'm not going to say no to it, but I would definitely just say, it's an, it's maybe it's not an everyday thing. Again, it depends on your requirements and your health and your budget. But for an for an, an adult, um, for the average adult, once once a week yeah. really within my advice guidelines, and just and just move around and enjoy different proteins each night. Um, yeah. Lean yeah. more towards you know your fish for the omega three and. Um, and then it can even come from a can too, which is cost effective. It's interesting. You you said um, the blue zones. There's that uh, uh, documentary on Netflix with Dan Butner talking yeah. about the blue zones, which are we've just finished oh. in our household. And it is, um, you know, the whole food diet, that real food diet, getting away from processed foods. I mean, that is seems to be where the current um, the current trend is trending towards in terms of living a long time, being healthy. That's right, isn't it? I, I Well, I studied the Blue Zones 20 years ago, and I'm 50, and I stopped um, having dinner, uh, like big dinners, when I uh, 20 years ago, and, I, and it's changed my life enormously. I base my, the way I kind of live now and what I prescribe very much on those kind of dietary guidelines because they do work in the circadian rhythms, and they, are, and they do have such a healthy relationship with food. And, and, I, and, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about the evidence. But the Blue Zones are fascinating because they have other things in their life which is about human connection and it's mm. about food preparation. There's nothing processed. There's nothing refined. There's no – everything is just – they generally grow their own food. Um, and this is where I always encourage people, my advice, you know, when you, with my love of the Blue Zone and interest in that diet is that where I always say to people, Learn to eat seasonally. If you learn to eat what is in season at that time of year, it's actually what our body needs. Like, for example, we're in spring. So everything about spring is about leafy greens. Makes sense. Coming off winter where we were doing soups and stews to keep us warm with a lot of root vegetables, potatoes and stuff, we're coming into spring now. So our body wants to detox more and support detox pathways. So we've got a lot more of the um, a kind of our leafy greens in season and a lot of citrus makes sense. Immunity. Plus, the biggest thing about learning to eat seasonally is you will save a huge amount of money because everything's locally grown, minimal transportation, which is bringing me back to the blue zones. Um, so it's a minimal, um, so they reckon all that and it's storage and transportation is at, um, at a minimum. You're supporting the local farmers. It's harvested when it's ripe. The nutrients are really dense. Um, and you pay next to, you know, $2 for a pound of the strawberries now as opposed to out of season, you pay six or eight. So yeah. it's a great way to learn as well. To, seasonal eating is a really interesting one, but it does. And the Blue Zones are very much based on that. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, it's yeah, really yeah. interesting. It's good stuff. Yeah. Sarah yeah. DiLorenzo, the author of the 1010 Simple Recipe book, thank you very much oh, for answering some of our questions. I love chatting with you. Lots of interesting stuff. It's all my passion. I love it. No thank worries. you so much for having me on. It was great. It was great to chat. Good on you. There she goes. Sarah DiLorenzo, the author of the 1010 Simple Recipe book. And Sarah's, uh, Sarah's been studying this a long time, and she makes some interesting points. And look, no doubt, it can be it can be expensive and time consuming to, you know, eat whole foods and all that you know that sort of stuff. It's much easier to just get a microwavable meal. But um, you know, look, I'm not an expert. Sarah is. It does seem to be that if you if you shop around, you know, maybe buy the imperfect stuff, which is you know definitely cheaper, and you eat that seasonal seasonal fruit and veg, um, you know. You can make beautiful food. You know, you can you can pay a fraction of the price, and uh, 
ultimately you can be you can be healthier in the long term. One three one eight seven three is our number. If you want to weigh in, maybe you've got some some advice. Uh, of the way you structure your diets, um, you know, maybe it's some some sneaky recipes or, you know, uh, ways you make uh, uh, cost-effective food go further. Love to hear from you here on Overnights, one three one eight seven three.